who led the nation of Israel out of um, slavery and bondage, and he led them to become a nation that was free. And if we look at his sort of rich heritage, and we look at essentially um, his life, we, we see some interesting characteristics and traits. And in Hebrews 11, which is sometimes referred to as the huddle of hope or the, the hall of heroes of faith, because in Hebrews 11, we see these interesting, ordinary, messed up people that look like the person that you look at in the mirror, and we see the opportunities and uh, the, the, the exploits that they accomplished and the things that they did. Now, my question is always, why, why was God able to use these people so effectively? And specifically, why was God able to use Moses so effectively? And I think this morning we're going to look at kind of four questions, basic questions that speak to each one of us. And when we answer them correctly, they begin to launch us into the quality of life and they allow us to be able to seize the hero challenge that we're presenting. The first one is the question of who am I? Who am I? Am I the sum total of the experiences of the past and the hurts that I've been through? Am I the half Italian, half German mutt that I was raised to be by my parents? Who exactly am I? He also answered, what are my choices? What, what can I choose to do in this life? What are the choices that are before me? He also asked, what's really important? What are, what are the values? What are the things that are uh, where I should put my attention? What, what are the things that I should give of my time? How should I give my time? Where should I invest my time? And then what are my goals? So in Hebrews eleven twenty three, we're going to look at this passage as we look at the questions that Moses answered. And here we go. You ready? Yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, I am ready. By faith, Moses, when he was born, he was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. For those of you who don't know, this, Moses was born during a time when the king had decreed that all uh, Jewish babies would be murdered. And so his mother, Jochebed, decided, and father, Amram, those are interesting trivia points for you, Amram and Jochebed, what are your parents' names? Um, decided that, uh, that they were going to rescue their son by putting him in a little basket, floating him down the Nile River. Most of us know that because of the boys being condemned to die, that his mother cared so much about him to protect him that she floated him down the river, and Pharaoh's daughter was the one that ended up finding him. And so we see that in verse 23. Verse 24, by faith Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, we don't want to jump too quickly past any of these uh, words, and, and we want to be able to extract from each of these verses so that it can help us to understand, God, how can we begin to experience what you have for us? So the first thing that we see and, and what comes out of these questions is God uses Moses so effectively because he determines to be himself. And so the the area for us is we have to become people who can be us, be you. Look at your neighbor and say, be you. Moses had an identity crisis in Egypt. The boys were being condemned. He gets rescued by Pharaoh's daughter. So he's born Jewish, but he's raised as an Egyptian. And at some point in his life, he has to decide, who am I? <laughs> I mean, you talk about a, a little bit of a crisis and an issue. I mean, and what would end up happening is that he'd make a decision that would cost him the next 80 years of his life. And in verse 24, we saw by faith Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, if you look at the word refused, it means that literally he rejected, he denied, he decided that he would totally disown this name. Now, most of us know what labels are like. We have had a label at some point, at some time. We've had a label. Maybe you grew up in a dysfunctional home. Maybe you were uh, subjected 
to uh, abuse, mental, physical, in some way, shape, or form. Maybe as a result, you were, you were labeled as something because at some point you had difficulty in learning. Maybe you, you are uh, an individual who struggled, and so at some point there are labels. Whether you like them or not, they could be good ones. Someone could have said you're hot, and all of a sudden you're like, I am. And you agreed with that label, and soon you, you decided and became a person with a bunch of stickers all over you that had labels. And oftentimes you'd respond in life, or we respond in life, to those labels. Sometimes those labels hurt. Sometimes the label of divorce or failure, the divorce, or excuse me, the label of, of poverty, all kinds of stuff that you and I go through. And Moses was in that same situation. Now, the tough part of his choice was that he, he had to do it in the face of great wealth, great uh, uh, popularity, great things that were there for him. The Bible says that he decided to not have the label that was afforded to him, but to be himself. And there's something that's liberating when you're yourself. I'll tell you as a pastor, uh, as being in the ministry for all, close to 13 years and traveling all over the wor world and doing some incredible things, I can tell you that even as a pastor, that label sometimes can rob me of being myself. Now, I have worked very hard at E3 Church to be who I am. Some of it is scary to some of you, but I believe that the only way, because God calls pastors to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, because you're the real superheroes of the church, and me as a person who's a follower of Christ is as well, not pastors. You with me? You're the superhero. And so as a result sometimes of pastors trying to project something of themselves more than they should, it frustrates people who are looking up to people in the pulpit and they think they're on a pedestal and it causes difficulty for them to understand how they can truly relate to God and have a relationship with God because they, they look up and they go, oh well, my God, I can't do all of that. And sometimes in places they have starched hats and lots of fanfare and it becomes difficult and people, instead of becoming closer to God, they're further away. But the moment we allow ourselves to be liberated to be ourselves, Hebrews eleven twenty five, 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. A sin we understand is to miss the mark. In other words, God had a plan for Moses. God had crafted his life like he has for you. He has a purpose. He has a destiny. And Moses decided that he was going to choose God's very best than he was to just sort of go on with the charade of missing the mark, and he said, I'm gonna say yes to God. He literally made a decision. And for us, it's what has to happen next. After we start to find and discover our identity in Christ, we have to quit blaming uh, and accept responsibility for our lives, just like Moses did. I mean, we can no longer be able to, to say it's not my fault or because of this or because of that that happened to me. Therefore, I am what Popeye said. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. You're more than that. Amen? Amen. You're everything that God said that you are. You have the mind of Christ. Your heart is full of the love of God. You have the ability beyond what you can, you can even imagine that lives on the inside of you and as you begin to respond and make a decision to follow what God's placed there and to trust it and, and to side with his side of the story, rather than maybe, like I said, the, uh, the, the sort of uh, bondage and chains that comes even re with religious oppression or that idea that you have in your hand that you're just in your head that you're never quite going to measure up to what God wants you to be. That's deciding to... Uh, Look at yourself in light of another, a different perspective outside of God's. But when we respond and say, all right, right now, from this moment forward, I can quit blaming the past. I can quit, quit blaming all that's happening. And I can respond to God and make a choice to live for him in my emotions. I can choose to live for him in my physical body. I can choose to stop making excuses for why I don't do this or don't do that in the totality of my life as I accept responsibility to say, this body that you've given me, God, it's the temple of the Holy Spirit. 
And today, instead of saying this about the past or that about family or whatever, you can say today is the day of salvation, the day that I'll experience the fullness of what God has for me. I'll quit making excuses. I'll quit blaming other people. Because Christianity is not a negative religion. It's not about don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. We sometimes have made it about this, and we sometimes have lost and uh, the, what the true essence of it is because we've spent our time with this negative image. But God comes along and he guides us and navigates us on what to do, how to live, how to have relationships, how to spend time, quality time with people, how to revere and reverence moments and take time to savor things. He gives us instructions to do it. Verse 23 says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. So God chose Moses as a baby, right? But at some point, Moses, when he grew up, he had to choose God. At some point, he couldn't allow sort of just what his mom or, or, or the situation and circumstances of where he was at. I mean, he had to choose and verse 25 tells us that he made the choice. See, God chose you. God loves you. God values you. God cares about you. He cares about every facet of your life, as I said before. But at some point, you have to accept the responsibility to choose him, to choose his love, to choose his goodness, to choose his story, to choose that you'll begin to see yourself and look at yourself in light of that, rather than all that you've sort of built and contrived and created that you think is success, that you think is, is the best life, at some point you have to choose God and say, God, I'm willing to choose what you have. I'll suffer the affliction of the present moment because there's something bigger and greater and you always got my back and you always care about me because what you have for me is the best possible life that I could ever want or I could ever imagine. So my question is, God's chosen you. Have you chosen him? Grow up. Grow up, you know, the opportunity to grow up and respond, because that is the mark of maturity. You can tell when people are immature in their life, and I've been there and probably am there in areas of my life, but when they are constantly blaming something outside of themselves. But next time somebody does that, you can, no, don't tell them grow up, but for one moment, it's the truth. And when you, it's not for you to use it as an ax against somebody else, but it's for you. The next time you find yourself complaining and, and, and going over and over about the past. The only way to overcome that is for you to make a decision that you can accept responsibility and you can choose God. But what else did Moses do? Moses began to value values. What's really important, verse 26 says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, he looked to the reward. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ is of greater value than the treasures in Egypt because he saw a bigger goal, a bigger vision. I mean, when you connect with Scripture and you change the way that you relate to the Bible and you stop looking at, at it as a negative book of, of do's and don'ts, because that's not what's in there. When you read it from the essence of the romantic picture that it is and God's desire to give you the life that you've always dreamed of, always imagined, all of a sudden, you take off religious glasses and you begin to look at it. And you begin to regard it differently as God begins to give instruction on the way that you and I are to go about life. And we look at things found in Acts as we see the early church getting together more often, breaking bread together. And you realize that there's intentionality behind that. Because you and I are being robbed of the depth of relationship that takes place when people break bread. And the enemy comes to tell us that you're alone and you're a loner, nobody likes you, you don't have any friends. And the funny part is, is as Paul shared last week while we were here, some of us look at other people. I mean, because I looked at Paul and I thought, Paul, that guy has so many friends and he is just so cool in the depth of his relationships. But even Paul, our literal Paul in church, Talked about that, and I guarantee you that every single one of us feels like we'd like to have somebody pick up the phone at some point and just ask us, how are you? Someone who just have a meal with us, look us in the eye and care about us deeply. Am I right? Listen, it starts with us. When we accept responsibility to turn to somebody this afternoon and say, would you like to have lunch? You wanna have a picnic in the, in, in the 
Oasis of the Desert, something, whatever. <laughs> so he esteemed that. And what were the values that he could have, right? I mean, the Bible says that the word regarded is to weigh and balance, to consider the options, to evaluate the worth. Like this is, this is what you and I are to do if, if I had a huge scale up here. This is the way that we're to intentionally and attentively ponder the scripture as God calls us to the best possible life. We're gonna weigh them. He considered it. So we know that there was a battle going on. Mo Moses was like, should I hang out in the palace with the Pharaoh? I mean, there must have been some times when he's like, yeah, I should. But, but he came back again and he, and he painted a visual image in his mind. The Bible tells us where, where there is a vision, people thrive. Where there's not, they suffer, they perish. And so that's, that's where we begin to meditate on what does God's word say about life? What does it say about this situation? What does it say about these decisions? How am I to live? God, you want me to pray? Give me a new picture that I'm not just like, oh, mom, or whatever. Show me how it's like an artist who paints a picture so that I can see the depth of your love and your goodness and the reality of your presence so that it can affect my current situations. Are you with me? And he says, do that. So he had the opportunity to value pleasure, to just feel good, to value possessions. I want more, to value power. I want to be famous. And each one of us faces that same thing. What's important? What's important? And I guarantee you we have lost that question oftentimes because I want to be rich. I want to be famous. I want to be and do what just feels good at the moment. Now, don't forget that God always tells us in John 10, 10, that his purpose, his vision for us was that we would have the best quality of life. So God never robs us, although at times we, when we discount or we, the weight shifts on the side of the things outside of what God has for us, we think, and then we experience them, and we're like, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't that. But he, he says over here, if you will weigh and consider what I have for you in every area, relationally, the physical side of this relationship, if you will do it in accordance with how I've created and crafted, because I know the DNA of a person, I know the depth, if you'll go to that level, then the physical side of this thing, in the context of a marriage relationship, will be beyond what you can imagine. Why? Because God wants to rob from us? No, because he's the creator of life and relationships and everything good, and he understands that you can only get to a certain depth when you've connected in a certain way. And he says, weigh the option. Why? Because I want you to experience what happened. So Moses decides, right, that this purpose, this, this plan that God has is more valuable. And people are more valuable. And so he decides that he is going to experience God's peace and he moves forward. And then he has the opportunity to say, you know, where do I put my attention? And he focuses on the goal. I mean, here's the deal. Moses had problems. He had, he had a ton of issues. But he began to focus on the goal. And as a result of that, he began to step outside of the problem. And as you've probably heard me say this before, you know, quit telling God how big your problems are and still start telling your problems how big your God is. Because in the middle of that, all the, the periphery goes away because you have laser focus and you begin to set your hearts on it. And so... Our challenge for the next 12 months is you've got one life. God's given you this one life that you have. He's given you this one body. He's given you this one brain. I know. I'm sorry. I know. He's given you the people that are surrounding you right now, the relationships that are here. And, and all of it he does so that you can experience the best of the best of the best of the best. But our responsibility to that is to esteem and value and respond and give time and attention and set aside time so that God can be lifted up and we can experience what he has for us in each of these areas. I love this passage of scripture in Exodus 14 and 15. If you've never read the account or the life of Moses, you should do it, you should do it, you should do it. But here he is at the most pivotal moment. He has now obeyed God through lots of distraction and fighting. He's dealt with several million people that he is now leading. Come on, let's go. God's gonna you know, do all kinds of things. They're, 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 they're eating and complaining and he is having to deal with a bunch of whiners and 
and babies, and all of a sudden they get to the Red Sea. The ar- Pharaoh's army is after them. He is looking at this magnificent, vast body of water, and he has come to the end of himself, and he is like, surely God will give me a break, cut me some slack. Dude, God, why? Why? Wah, the ambulance, wah. And listen to how compassionate God is to us. He says in verse 15, think about yourself, all that you complain about. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Let me say it in Brad's translation. Moses, shut the heck up and go forward. And God says the same thing to us. I know it doesn't sound very light and fluffy and compassionate, but wherever you are at, Whatever you're experiencing difficulty in, whatever it is that you need triumph and victory to overcome, whatever obstacle, whatever problem, God says the same thing to you. Go forward. I'll ease off on the shut up. Quit opening your mouth and giving attention and praise and honor and worship and exaltation to misery and failure and hurt and pain and struggles and discouragement and give praise and honor and glory to me because I'm the author of life. I'm the creator of all things. I'll read this passage and then I will be quiet and go forward. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 says, Therefore, we do not become discouraged, utterly spiritless, exhausted, and wearied out through fear. Though our outer man is progressively decaying and wasting away, yet our inner self is being progressively renewed day after day. Verse 17, for our light momentary affliction, this slight distress of the passing hour is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculations of vast and transcendent glory and blessedness never to cease since we consider and look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen for the things that are visible are temporal brief and fleeting but the things that are invisible are deathless and they are everlasting this is written by paul who describes light afflictions as being beaten three times nearly to death, shipwrecked, receiving 40 stripes five times, been in prison. He's the one who writes these words, obviously authored by the Holy Spirit. It's always a matter of perspective. So, Moses refused, he chose, he regarded, he saw, and then he endured. That's one of the things that I probably like so much, is that he endured. And, you know, over the, the next several weeks, several months, we have the opportunity to choose. What will the direction of our days and our hours and our moments be? Will we live with attention and intention? Will we give to what God desires for us so that we can extract it? Or will we just try doing what we've been doing the way that we've been doing it? Is it time for us to begin to to look at our uh, spiritual life? Now, for some of us, it's hard. Maybe, maybe we didn't grow up in an environment where prayer was something that we did on a consistent basis. You know, maybe it's, it's time to go buy a, 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 an actual Bible. That could be good. But anyway, I wasn't going to say that. I was going to say like a book of prayers. Maybe something you could find where somebody else has written out something and you could begin to recite those. You know, I think at some point all of us, you know, have heard the Lord's Prayer on some form or fashion. And while it can become, like I said, religious and and kind of liturgy, sometimes liturgy needs to be refreshed so that we can begin to say something because what our heads and what our culture and what we're currently involved with seems to be the dominant voice. So how do you overcome that? Because you start to give attention to the voice of God. You start your day. This is the day that you have made. I will rejoice and I will be glad in it. And you begin to, to give voice to those things. You look at other areas physically that the Bible tells us that if we'll take an opportunity to revere ourselves as a temple of the Holy Spirit, not, not because God's like, you know, he's, you're getting brownie points with him, but because he wants you to experience the fact that you, you have two legs, two arms. If you don't, you know, you can watch somebody who doesn't and see all that they do and remind yourself, hey, man, I need to take a walk. 
I need to take a run. I need to take a jog. I need to do something because this is the one life, the one body that I've been given. I need to pay closer attention to my emotions instead of letting them run off and just destroy me. I need to recognize that I have the mind of Christ. Now, how, how can I invest into that and take the opportunity to do it? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can get ideas and examples by the lives of men who are just like us, ordinary Mo. Ordinary Moses is just like ordinary me. Just like me, Father, and you did extraordinary things through him and you desire to do extraordinary things through us. This morning, Father, we desire to respond to your goodness, to your grace, to your mercies, to your passion. If you're here this morning, as I said before, and maybe you, you get it. God chose you. God did all kinds of things for you. He loves you, but you've never responded or chose him. Maybe the last few years and last few months or whatever, you've been choosing everything but him. This morning, it's not out of guilt or manipulation that I ask you. It's out of joy and refreshing and beginning to discover new things that God has for you. Is there anyone here this morning that wants to respond to choosing him, to choosing God? God sent Jesus to die on a cross for you, to give his life, to shed his blood, to rise again, so that you can become a child of God. If you're here this morning and that's you, very quickly would you lift your hand and say, that's me, Brad, pray for me. Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hand. Anybody else here this morning that says, thank you, I see your hand. Anybody else? It says, count me in on that. I need me some of that. All right, let's pray together. Everybody's head bowed and eyes closed. Say, God, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross as a sacrifice for my sins that I have committed, that I will commit. Thank you that he rose again so that I could be free, free from guilt, free from condemnation, free to be a child of God. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, say, oh yes, amen, amen, and oh yes.